Hello, and welcome to Session 13 of the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program. I'm Adam Miller, Program Director for the DSFP. Session 13 focuses on the analysis of time series data from astronomical wide field surveys. As is typically the case, I'll be providing this brief introductory lecture in order to lay the groundwork for the five detailed lectures that follow as well as their accompanying notebooks. So without further ado, let's jump into it. The falling cost of silicon detectors, and in particular also the falling cost of data storage, has led to a pretty consistent theme over the past decade. And that is the proliferation of wide field surveys. Here you'll see, to scale, the relative field of view of many different surveys that have started within the past decade as well as in the lower right-hand corner, the DOE LSST camera, which has a field of view of 10 square degrees. And that, of course, will be part of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Okay. The motivation behind building all of these wide field cameras is straightforward. More. The idea is to just get more of everything, right? We want more field of view, which allows us to survey more volume which in turn allows us to find more objects, which in turn allows us to build better statistics and ultimately better scientific results, or more significant results, I should say. Furthermore, having more also increases our ability to find rare objects, providing a lot of discovery potential that previously was not possible. All of these efforts will in some ways culminate in the next few years with the onset of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory and its Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST. From Lucianne's introduction of the Rubin Observatory talk, we know that the LSST DOE camera can detect a source at about 24.5 magnitudes in a 30 second exposure. We also know if we go talk to our friends that work on dark energy, that weak lensing requires us to, competitive weak lensing measurements require us to measure sources at a depth of about 27.5 magnitudes. So three magnitudes corresponds to roughly a factor of 16 in flux, which in turn corresponds to about a factor of 250 in exposure time. So if we want to get down to 27.5 magnitudes in order to do the weak lensing science that we hope to do with the Rubin Observatory, that means that in every single field that we want to observe, we're going to need something like 7,500 seconds or a little over two hours of total exposure time. So that brings us to the first breakout problem for today's lecture. Should we take two hour long exposures with the Rubin Observatory? I'll now pause and I'll encourage you to pause the video at home so you can spend a moment thinking about the answer. All right, so shall we take these very long exposures? There's actually several reasons why hour or hours long exposures with a telescope like the Rubin Observatory are probably not a great idea. Things like saturating your bright stars, having satellite streaks from Starlink, uh, the accuracy of your telescope in terms of being able to track over time periods of several hours. But chief among the reasons I would be worried to do something like this are cosmic rays. If you were to do a two hours long exposure, you would have cosmic rays obliterating a very substantial fraction of your pixels. And every one of those pixels that corresponds to a galaxy or a star in your image suddenly becomes something that you cannot model well in terms of measuring the flux or shape of your sources. Okay, so long exposures are probably not the best idea. All right. We also have bigger detectors than we've ever had before. But, as I just pointed out, we're limited to short exposures. So if we have short exposures and a big detector, well, we can move our telescope in between observations. And if you have, like the Rubin Observatory, a 10 square degree field of view, well, that means if you're moving the telescope every 30 seconds, but 10 square degrees, eventually you will literally run out of sky. So as a result of this, I contend that the time domain 
is inevitable. In fact, the Rubin Observatory requires time domain observations, even if the only science you care about is measuring weak lensing. Okay. Nevertheless, the time domain observations that are going to be obtained will beget new science goals. They will open a whole new avenue for investigation and study with the Rubin Observatory. And this session, session 13, is specifically focused on how to analyze data that's been obtained in the time domain. Um, as a very quick aside, I just want to talk a little bit about the different types of time domain data that we can achieve. Standard ground-based time series photometry looks something like this. So here you see a light curve. It extends over several years. Uh, there's many observations within that light curve, a light curve being a measurement of a source's flux as a function of time. Okay. And there's a few salient features to pick out from this plot. In particular, there are large gaps in the observations. And when a source goes behind the sun, that's typically a several month or as much as a six month period when we cannot obtain any observations of that source whatsoever. The observations are themselves very noisy. Typical ground-based photometry is uh, at best about 1% flux variations are measured. And uh, there are many non-Gaussian processes that are present in the data. Because of things like clouds and our inability to perfectly reconstruct the attenuation that occurs between a source that is emitting photons and our detector here on the surface of the Earth, we get non-Gaussian processes present in our time series data. All of these things make it difficult to analyze such data. Standard signal processing procedures in the literature um, don't necessarily account for all these issues. In particular, it's often the case that time series is assumed to be regularly spaced observations. Essentially, I have some instrument and every 10 seconds I'm going to make some new measurement. Right? But that's simply not possible with ground-based observatories. Um, it's also typically the case that homoscedastic uncertainties, or in other words, the uncertainties are the same on every single measurement, is assumed. And again, for ground-based observatories where we have absolutely no control over things like clouds, right? we never can provide a time series that has homoscedastic uncertainties. Okay. So all of these are regimes that we don't typically have access to in astronomy. Until about 10 years ago with the launch of the Koro satellite and more recently the Kepler and now TESS satellites. Now these space-based satellites that are specifically designed to search for small radius planets actually do manage to achieve, to achieve observations uh, of pristine quality. So the satellites are above the atmosphere, so there is no atmospheric or cloud attenuation of the light coming from these sources, while also being able to maintain a regular cadence over a long period of time. So here's a zoom in on a Kepler light curve of a variable star, and you can see that observations are obtained every 30 minutes in this particular case. Um, furthermore, the precision of these measurements is quite high. So we have very precise uh, parts per million, in some cases, accuracy from these satellites with regular intervals, 30 minutes in the case of Kepler, a little bit longer in the case of TESS, I believe. Uh, and in some cases, very long durations as well. Kepler looked at its initial field for four straight years. Okay. As a re result, we're now in a regime where astronomical time series analysis is basically two different regimes. regimes. There are ground-based surveys with large gaps in the data and heteroscedastic uncertainties, and space-based planet hunting surveys. We're going to cover analysis methods for both types of time series before the end of the week. Okay, so the sheer number of sources detected by LSST, remember, as a reminder, that's about 37 billion, means that spectroscopy is out of reach for essentially everything. We're talking a tiny fraction of everything that is observed by the Rubin Observatory will actually get a spectrum at some point in time. So a significant and possibly the most significant challenge in the Rubin Observatory era will be extracting information from photometric-only data sets. 
Now, I contend, and I will admit I'm very biased here because my research is primarily focused in the time domain, but I contend that one of the ways in which LSST and the Rubin Observatory are going to be exceptionally transformative is in the time series that they obtain not so much of explosive transients, which is also a big area of interest, but actually in the time series of persistent objects or stars and in some cases galaxies, like an active galactic nucleus. To put some perspective into this, everything brighter than 21st magnitude will have photometry that is more accurate than 1%. And that photometry is going to be measured over a duration of 10 years. This is completely unlike anything that has ever been done before. It's also unlike anything that anyone is planning at the moment. Furthermore, any star that is that bright will also have a relatively accurate distance measurement from the Gaia satellite as well. So we're talking about unprecedented access to measurements of distance and variability for a huge swath of stars throughout our galaxy. I think this is an incredibly intriguing data set that's going to be very, very valuable, not just during the Rubin Observatory, but even afterwards as well as a legacy for that project. What does it mean to have 1% photometry for these sources? Uh, for example, every single hot Jupiter around a 21st magnitude star or brighter will be found by the Rubin Observatory. Every asteroid that's brighter than 21st magnitude will have a very accurate rotation period measured. The most distant stars in the Milky Way halo are going to be identified by the variability light curves from the Rubin Observatory. Okay, so these are just a few examples of the exciting things that are going to be possible over the next several years. So that brings me to breakout problem number two. What information might we want to extract from light curves? I'll, pa I'll let you now pause so you can take a second to think of your response. So there are many things that might be useful, information that might be useful to extract from a light curve. Uh, just things like how bright is a source getting, how faint is a source getting, um, when do changes in brightness occur, right? what is the rate of those changes. But I contend that the most useful thing that we can pull out of a light curve is a measurement of periodicity. I think periodicity is the most fundamental, fundamental signal in astronomical time series. And that's because periodic signals are always very closely related to fundamental physics. Right? Measuring a period instantly tells you about the orbit of a system, or if you have an individual star, it tells you about its po internal pulsations or rotation. If you can measure the period of a source, you can essentially infer something fundamental about its nature. All of the previously mentioned challenges, the fact that we have large gaps in the data, heteroscedastic uncertainties, non-Gaussian outliers, make it very difficult to measure periodic signals in ground-based data. For that reason, this is going to be a major theme throughout the course of this session. We will also discuss how you deal with gaps and heteroscedastic uncertainties. And so with that done, <clears throat> let's jump into the lectures and let the analysis begin.